Who are the key players? What are the key storylines? And what are the key matchups of the Baltimore Ravens week 12 game against the Jacksonville Jaguars? We dive into all that and more coming up next here on Locked on Ravens on a special Thanksgiving edition of Crossover Thursday. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostrecker of Ravens Wire. We're here on the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much for tuning in, making us your first listen of the day or free and available on all platforms, including over on YouTube. And if you're here with us on YouTube, be sure to subscribe, like this video. And if you're in audio form, be sure to follow along anywhere you get your shows, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. We put out Day of the Ravens content five days per week. So if you want that Ravens news, Ravens analysis, and more, be sure to subscribe and follow along for the ride. And here today, we're going to be diving into a crossover Thursday, Baltimore facing off against Jacksonville in Jacksonville for a week 12 matchup. Trevor Lawrence versus Lamar Jackson. You have Travis Etienne over there, Christian Kirk. But Baltimore has their guys too. That Baltimore defense playing great. We'll dive into this crossover Thursday with Tony Wiggins of Locked On Jaguars. But it is Thanksgiving here today, so we'll have a special Thanksgiving twist on the episode today. And I also just want to, you know, shout out what I'm thankful for. I'm obviously thankful for my family and friends for the support that I've gotten from them, but also for the listener, for you. So Thank you so much for tuning in, whether this is your first Lock and Ravens episode or your 859th. That's how many I've recorded here. 859 consecutively every single weekday since August of 2019. I've recorded this show. So it's been a, been a long time here, but I've enjoyed every second of it. I'm so thankful for the show, for this network, and for everything. It's just a chance to step back and really, you know, really appreciate things. Although you should appreciate things each and every day, not just Thanksgiving. So I'm appreciative for family, friends, and you, the listener, each and every day. But without any further ado, let's dive into Crossover Thursday with Tony Wiggins of Locked On Jaguars. I'm Kevin Ostraker of Locked On Ravens here with me, Tony Wiggins of Locked On Jaguars. Thank you so much for tuning in with us, making us both your first listen of the day here. We're free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube in video form. And today's episode of both Locked On Ravens and Locked On Jaguars is presented by Price Picks. Price Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Just pick two to five players, and if they score more or less in their Price Picks projection, you go up to 10 times the money on your entry. First time user can receive 100% instant in deposit match up to $100 or promo code locked on. That's pricepicks.com. Promo code locked on. And Tony, I'm excited for this one. Ravens and Jaguars matching up in week 12. Jacksonville coming off of their bye. The Ravens coming off of a gritty, grinded out win. People call that ugly win against the Carolina Panthers in week 12. And two talented quarterbacks in the more Jackson and Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, man. And one who is super, super proven. I think he is the biggest headache in the league uh, for, for defenses. And I said that earlier this week on one of my podcasts. This is a tough game for the Jaguars to be coming off of a bye and trying to establish their identity down the stretch with seven games to go. Now, it looks like the playoffs is going to be out of the question, but they can start building something for next year. And they're playing the team that has the ultimate identity, whether that is a pretty identity or not. The Baltimore Ravens are the winningest, ugliest team over the years that I've ever seen. It does not matter how, and you saw that last week in their game against Carolina. They find a way to win, and it's all really because of number eight and his magic and their ability to know who they are. And the Jaguars are trying to find who they are. So that's why this is so interesting because it's like they'll be looking at, while they're not stylistically the same, the Jaguars will be looking at a team that does exactly what Jacksonville has to learn how to do if they want to be good. Right, this identity of Baltimore, absolutely 100% running the football. Baltimore's the second best rushing team on offense right now. They are averaging a very high clip of 5.4 yards per carry, but also on defense, their identity has been stopping the ground game. They are the seventh best rush defense in the NFL. Jacksonville has a very talented young runner over there in Travis Etienne after the trade of James Robinson. That bell cow roll, that, that's a storyline for me, is can Baltimore dominate the ground game both offensively with their run game? John Harbaugh seems optimistic about the chances of Gus Edwards playing, it, especially earlier on in the week, but also can they stop Travis Etienne in that Jacksonville ground game, because I think that's a key for the Ravens in terms of being able to phase that offensive part of Jacksonville's game plan out and have the Jacksonville offense become a bit more one-dimensional. Yeah, and uh, if they try to stop that early and if they have a lot of success, then Jaguar fans are fine with Trevor Lawrence 
dropping back and testing the secondary. Something I think he has to be aware of is Peters. Peters will give you looks that you probably think are good ones, and then they're not so good because he is always going to challenge. You might be able to make some big plays on him. He's sort of similar to Trayvon Diggs in that way, but you'll get some plays on him. But every now and then you get greedy and you go over there and and he's going to take it the other way because that's what he has made a career out of doing. And then Marlon Humphrey on the other side, it's like watching a mature version of Tyson Campbell, who is the Jaguars' big 6'1 corner on that side that you don't hear from a lot because people don't really go after him that much, and that's because he's so sound, and that's what Marlon Humphrey represents. And then, of course, Uncle Calais is coming home, and even though he was only here for three years, this city absolutely loves Calais Campbell. He uh, was integral in uh, the win in Carolina the other day, and he's just he exemplifies what a leader is. And I know the Baltimore Ravens started out, they were having a little bit of trouble. I know they leaned on Calais Campbell to kind of turn that thing around a little bit. So some familiarity in that part of it. But make no mistake about it, this all starts and stops. The Alpha and Omega, this entire deal is Lamar Jackson. And the reason why I say that, uh, KO, is because you can think you have him contained and then just like that, he'll do something that will totally change the game, change the complexion of the game and reinstill whatever fear you were able to overcome because you played well for a couple of quarters with him. So he is coming home to Florida and he is a problem for us. And uh, I'm just going to remind Ravens fans because Jaguar fans know this, they could have picked him, but they didn't because they were committed to Blake Bortles and they chose Taven Bryan. So we get that out of the way. He was sitting right there and they had to pick. I was at the draft party and the fans went crazy. They thought they were going to take Lamar Jackson and they didn't. So we have Trevor Lawrence now. We're good to go with that. But the thing is, is it's going to be a big test for Trevor Lawrence to be the threat that Lamar Jackson is, especially coming off of a bye week and with Baltimore having it rolled and trying to make sure that they secure a, a home playoff game. Yeah, in that draft, there were, I think, New Orleans traded up, and I thought that was going to be Lamar Jackson. I thought Jacksonville was definitely going to take him. I thought New England was going to take him before they took, who was it, Isaiah Wynn and Sonny Michelle. Or, they had two picks in the first round. The Patriots yep. passed on him twice. So the Ravens, they pick Hayden Hurst, and, man, I, I wanted Lamar the whole way. So I was thinking, come on now. But then they traded into the first round at the end there, and they got him. But you mentioned Marcus Peters. You mentioned Marlon Humphrey. Tony and the turnovers have been really, really big for the Ravens this year. Last year, they did not force anything, you know, the turnovers and the, the secondary was banged up, like really banged up. Peters missed the entire season. Right. Humphrey goes down with the torn bicep, but they've already surpassed their 2021 turnover total this year. They are intercepting footballs there. Marcus Peters forced a fumble last week against Carolina. Marlon Humphrey with an interception himself. Jason Pierre Paul got an interception. So they forced three turnovers on Baker Mayfield and that that Panthers offense. But I think when you're talking about the Ravens and just turnovers in general, there's such momentum changes for both sides, for, for both defenses, getting the ball back to your offense and being able to kill any momentum an offense has. That is key. And I think it is the reason where, you know, in that game against Carolina, it was three to three going into the fourth quarter. It was a very, you know, the Ravens couldn't get anything going. The Panthers couldn't get anything going. It was a defensive, defensive match, but then Baltimore gets the ball back in the offense's hands. The momentum goes back to Baltimore's side, and that's all it takes. One or two momentum swings here and there that can win you a football game. And Lamar Jackson in this offense, you know, I guess pure stats-wise, yeah, definitely struggled. It was a game where there was no consistency on offense until the fourth quarter. But we've seen, like, the wire-to-wire win against the Saints. The offense was great. The second half against Tampa Bay, the offense was great. And they rode out the ground game doing that. So hopefully Gus Edwards will be back here and he'll be able to contribute to that. But that's one of the other keys is being able to get the momentum by forcing early turnovers. You mentioned Peters. I completely agree with what you said, where he makes things – he just – He's a deceptive guy. He he baits quarterbacks into throws. We saw it during his first season. Russell Wilson, his first ever game as a Raven, he did it and returned a ball for a pick six. So he's so impactful. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Trevor Lawrence can do against this defense because they've settled in under Mike McDonald. And I, I hope that in this one, for at least Baltimore's sake, Trevor Lawrence gets a little bit rattled. But Trevor Lawrence is not going to go down here without a fight, definitely. No, he's not. He's played extremely well over the last two weeks. And I challenge anyone to find – uh five quarterbacks over the last two games that have played as well as Trevor Lawrence has played. He, he feels like to me, what he's done is he's found that happy medium and that, that solid ground between being passive aggressive, but also being smart 
and understanding who his team is around him. He's been a lot more accurate lately as well. And I think he had to. I think I think Trevor Lawrence can tell you there's probably two games where if he didn't make critical mistakes and they were mistakes, not like they were pressing at the end or anything. It's like they, they had to leave, bro, and had first and goal on like the four, and he threw a couple of passes that all he has to do is just throw those things into the stands, to the hot dog stand, and just live to see another day. And the Jaguars probably go up two scores in those games. And once they do that, the dynamic of the way the game is played changes. And he didn't do it. And then there were some games where he missed some wide open receivers. The last two weeks, though, he has been phenomenal. And I think these this is one of the things that you want to want to see down the stretch. You want him to continue with that and to see that momentum build for next year. And, and it's sad that we're thinking about next year already, but the bottom line is they have a tough schedule. They got to play the Cowboys. They got to play the Ravens. They have two, two games against the Titans. And they only have seven left, right? So you think they got to go 7-0 and to even try to have a – uh, a run at the playoffs and they got to go at least six and one to try to have a you know a wild card the likelihood of that happening with those games that i just mentioned and detroit is the other game that's not easy so uh they already lost to houston here and they got to go to houston and that's not easy if it was they wouldn't have lost to them the first time so the thing for me is people are looking for some optimism heading into next season and i think moral victories don't matter because it's win loss or tie not almost not moral victory but by the same token, you still want to see him at that critical position play well down the stretch, and I think he has a chance to do that this weekend. Yeah, and in terms of Baltimore's schedule, they are a team that only has one team left that has a winning record right now, and that's Cincinnati in their last week. They have this game against Jacksonville. They have Denver. They have Atlanta. Two games against Pittsburgh still left. You got Cleveland. So this is a team that, you know, realistically could win a lot, a lot of games down the stretch and make their case in an NFL that I think is wide open right now. I think Kansas City's still probably the favorite for most people right now based off of what we've seen, but the AFC has Buffalo. It has Miami. Baltimore's in that conversation. So I do think that the Ravens have a chance here. I think the division is theirs to lose. They just have to be able to capitalize on these games here and win games that, you know, they're likely supposed to win for the most part. But coming up, we'll talk about key matchups. We'll talk about that quarterback matchup a little bit more, defensive guys, and more still to talk about here on both Locked On Ravens and Locked On Jaguars. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy Online. I know sometimes in life, things happen. And when things happen, you absolutely need some help. You can't do it yourself. And I totally understand that more than anybody. I've been, I went through a divorce, had to get over that, had to try. And the worst thing that I could have ever done was attempt to help myself. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with a user manual. So when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you and better help has connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists it's convenient secure and accessible anywhere 100 percent online whether or not you've been in therapy personally talk about the broader benefits and and the things that you have to do when you go to therapy you can learn how to cope you can learn how to get back on track and that's exactly what you need to do no waiting rooms no traffic no endless searching for the right therapist if you don't have the right match better help will allow you to switch to a therapist that fits you down to the t get unstuck with better help learn more and save 10 percent off your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on that's betterhelp h-e-l-p.com slash locked on we're back here, our second segment of both Locked On Ravens and Locked On Jaguars. Kevin Ostraker is still here with Tony Wiggins on Thanksgiving Day. And we'll get into Thanksgiving in the final segment, talking about some side dishes that we have on our minds right now, because we have we have a good conversation about that, so you won't want to miss it. But we got to talk about matchups here, Tony. There, there's something about this Ravens team and their defense. The Ravens have been known for their defense over the course of a while. My, my key matchup, one of them at least, is how Marlon Humphrey matches up with Christian Kirk. You know, the Christian Kirk is a player that, you know, the signing was very much criticized across the league when it first happened for the money that he got. 
in the years that he got on that deal, but he has been a godsend for what this Jacksonville offense has been trying to do. Marlon Humphrey has had a bounce back year. Both these guys are very versatile as well, which I like. You can kind of line them up all over the place. So my, my first key matchup is I'm looking forward to what Marlon Humphrey and Christian Kirk do against each other when they are matched up on one another. Yeah, that's going to be extremely critical to watch because Kirk is a guy who can really, really get off the line and he knows – He's fast and he's quick and he's twitchy. He's almost like a running back playing wide receiver. Um, Trevor Lawrence, he's you know has gone at him. He's he's targeted him eighty two times. They they've connected fifty two times. He has six hundred and seventy nine yards and seven TDs. Now that's through ten games. It's going to turn out that this kid might end up with eleven hundred yards and twelve touchdowns. And then everybody will have to backtrack on some of those things they said about his contract. That when you really really look at it, Kevin, it's it's really it was really front loaded for two years to give him a whole bunch of cash up front. Uh, the average per year doesn't matter because no one ever sees that last year of a contract where there's a big balloon payment. And I keep telling people that it's monopoly money. The thing is, is he was one catch away. He had nine hundred and eighty two yards. He was one catch away from having a thousand yards. So nobody actually would say that if he got that one more crossing route and he had a thousand yard season, the per- perception would have been a lot different. I, I think it was critical critical for Jacksonville to get him. He's not a number one. Their number one will come next year because they made a trade for Calvin Ridley. When he gets reinstated, he'll walk into camp as the number one receiver. But he's a very, very good, capable number two who can get open and create that little bit of distance between those defensive backs and create that window so Trevor Lawrence can be accurate with the football. So, yeah, it's really, really worked out. That's an incredible matchup. My matchup, though, is – I think we're going to see a little bit more of Chad Muma uh, in, in, instead of Devin Lord. Devin Lord has had a lot of problems when people cross his face. Tight ends, running backs, running across the formation. Last week he ran over his own linebacker, and the guy didn't make the tackle. And then whoever it was was running down the field for 30 yards. So he's a first-round pick who has had some big moments because he's gotten his hands on a few interceptions. But – he hasn't looked really, really good last, you know, the last couple of weeks. And they have played Muma, who was a third round pick. They played Chad Muma a, a little bit more. I anticipate you'll see that also this week. I think he's just instinctively from the mic position uh, right now, a little bit more prepared to play. They're going to need him in the run game. They're going to need him also to watch out for Lamar Jackson because there's no matchup to me that's bigger than it. It always comes back to number eight for me. He is just that dynamic and I have that much respect for him. Yeah, and in terms of what Baltimore does with their offense, they like putting people across the field. The the offense runs through, the, or at least the pass offense, runs through their tight ends. You know, the wide receiver one for them is Devin Duvernay with the shot, Bateman being out for the year after undergoing foot surgery. Mm-hmm. So you have Mark Andrews, who has been their top pass catcher. You know, he's been the guy for them. But you have Josh Oliver, who former Jacksonville guy over there, who you know. He's somebody who has actually played pretty well for Baltimore this season. It's I wanted them to keep him. I, I was mad that, that they got rid of him because he had just come off of an injury. So if he goes out here and chops Jacksonville up, everybody's going to be looking at Trent Baalke with the side. i like, why'd you get rid of him for nothing? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there. it's crazy because there was a conditional seventh, I think it was. And I think the conditions were if they kept him on the roster, if Baltimore kept him on the roster, the Jackson, Jackson gets that pick. If not, then it goes back to the Ravens. So it was a dart throw on a third, former third rounder with athletic upside. I mean, it was a pick or it was a trade that people were kind of like, eh, all right, like it, it's a trade. But Oliver's actually played as like their de facto number two tight end, which is he's he's been very good for them. And then Isaiah Likely, who was picked out of Coastal Carolina, he's somebody who you can line up all over the place. Maybe we'll see the debut of Charlie Kohler this week, who was their other tight end selection. So in terms of linebackers matching up on these tight ends, it can be difficult for offenses to, or for defenses, excuse me, to be able to match up with them well. But I also think when you're talking about the defense for the Ravens, I talked about Travis Etienne in the first segment. Patrick Queen and Roquan Smith, that new linebacker duo, those two guys have been electric, especially in their first two games of Baltimore, but they were playing well before they united in Baltimore. Queen has had an amazing third season here, 2020 first round pick out of LSU, and Roquan Smith, obviously, that stud out of Georgia, who two-time All-Pro, 25 years old. Now, ETN's a stud himself, don't get me wrong. I think he's going to be good in this league for a very, very long time, and that, that Trevor Lawrence, Travis ETN duo has come over since college here. I know ETN missed the first year here, but ETN in space is a dangerous player. He's a dangerous, dangerous player. And I think for Patrick Queen and Roquan Smith, being able to bring him down at the defensive line, and you're talking about Calais Campbell, they have guys like just Matt Abika on that line. 
they can clear the way for those linebackers to make open field tackles on a player like Etienne and stop that run game. That's extremely important for me, especially because those two have shown the ability also to cover these guys out of the backfield, especially Roquan Smith in that regard. Yeah, let me get back to Mark Andrews real quick before I talk about Roquan, because that was the most Baltimore Raven trade ever. But uh, Andrews, uh, I know he's been out for a couple of weeks because I have him on my fantasy roster. So that's how I know he's been out. But uh, good to see him get back in the group uh, because I, I, I do think, you know, obviously Travis Kelsey is number one. I think Mark Andrews is number two. I think Mark Andrews is the second best tight end in the NFL, and then there's a bunch of guys after him. When he said, "Now Darren Waller, when he's healthy, I get it, but he hasn't been healthy very much." So uh, Andrews looked like himself last week. That's dangerous for Jacksonville because uh, these young guys they have they've had a, they've had a problem, you know, in the middle of the field covering tight ends, and this is a, about the most dynamic tight end they're going to play outside of uh, uh, Kelsey, who they played uh, last week before the bye. So. The thing is, is though the threat when they come out of the huddle with Lamar that, that I keep getting back to, that is the most dangerous thing. And that's why I think it creates openings and windows. Now, you talk about Roquan, Roquan Smith and McQueen. They look like twins. They are, in my opinion, what the Jaguars hoped Foy Oluwakan and Devin Lloyd would have been. And that is almost carbon copies of the two guys in Baltimore, in Tampa, Devin White, and uh, the, what's the, the, the Hall of Fame linebacker, Devin White and, and his running mate, who I can't remember his name, but um, those two guys, uh, the, Levante David, Devin White, Levante oh, David, yeah. those two guys are quick, fast. In the 0-4-3, they both would have been probably weak side linebackers, but that's what Jacksonville probably wanted. They wanted guys that could trigger, get downhill, and uh, Roquan Smith has made his presence known immediately and right away. And like I said, that is the most Baltimore trade ever because you go out and you spend a future second-round pick or whatever on a guy that is basically a Pro Bowl Mike linebacker who comes in and he fits everything that you want to do right now. So Travis Etienne has his work cut out for him because after Etienne, they don't have another running back. They traded away James Robinson and Jermichael J- Hasty has left a lot to be desired. So I figure that's easy work for those two guys because they're so active. That's why I think something you brought up earlier is going to have to happen. Trevor Lawrence is going to have to he's going to have to step up and hit some big boy throws down the field and really challenge that secondary. And I think the Jaguars need to be aggressive anyway. The way they started out the game against KC, they were super super aggressive. A lot of the stuff looked like it was supposed to work and then they just had penalty after penalty after penalty and it cost them. I think they need to go right back to that formula this week because you don't want to play a low scoring game against Baltimore because if you do you're going to lose. Yeah, and in terms of just what the Ravens gave up for Roquan Smith, people people were, I think, excited that Eric DaCosta decided to part with that second-round pick. Baltimore's not been, like, a great second-round drafting team. I, I'm curious if you remember some of these guys. You remember, like, Arthur Brown and, and of course. like, Correa and all these. I like, remember all of it. All, all, all of these, like, Terrence Cody's and Sergio Kindles and all yeah, these guys. Yeah, yeah, but now go do the fourth, fifth, and the sixth round, and then you'll see. <laughs> and, that, and that's they've what been, it is. They've been yep. wearing you out in, in those rounds, and, and Ozzy was the king of trading back and getting to that hot spot right there, but like, between pick number 100 and maybe, you know, 160 or 180, and he makes a living in that area, and those guys end up coming in there and being very, very good at a cheap price. You're exactly right. And so my, my whole thing is, while your second round pick might not be making like the $18 million, $20 million per season Roquan Smith is about to make, you want your second round pick to be Roquan Smith. You know, Roquan Smith is 10 times what that second round pick already is. So no, no. I, I'm excited for him and hopefully Baltimore are able to get a deal done with him. But coming up here, we're going to be diving into our final predictions for this game. And that Thanksgiving conversation I've been teasing is coming up. So be sure to stay tuned. Still a ton to dive into. But first... This episode is sponsored by Bet Online and BetOnline.net is the number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional amateur league out there from football to basketball to soccer and esports. We've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. You guys, those that use mobile device to learn more, BetOnline, where the game starts. 
And this episode is also sponsored by Simply Safe. And the Ravens defense has been playing super well recently. They're going to be trying to stop that Jacksonville offense. But if you're thinking about securing your home with home security, but have been putting it off, you'll want to listen up right now. Locked on Ravens and Locked on Jaguars listeners can order the number one rated Simply Safe home security system for 50% off. This is their biggest offer of the year, and you won't want to miss it. And there are so many reasons why people love Simply Safe. They have fast protect technology that exclusively from Simply Safe captures critical evidence and verifies the threat is real so you can get priority police response. Simply Safe is whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. And they have AC security cameras for inside and out. That's smarter ways to detect motion that alert you only when a threat is real and even hazard sensors to detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. So don't miss this chance to stay big on the only security system that so many recommend. Get 50% off any new Simply Safe at simplysafe.com slash locked on NFL today. This is their biggest discount of the year. So don't wait. That's simplysafe.com slash locked on NFL. There's no safe like Simply Safe. And we're back here, both Locked On Ravens and Locked On Jaguars. Kevin Allstriker is still here with Tony Wiggins. And Tony, this game here, it's, it's a big one for both sides. I think you mentioned Jacksonville just being able to build for next season. And maybe that sliver, sliver of hope for this one. But at the same time, for Baltimore, you have a game that this would put their winning streak up to five. They would improve the record to eight and three and continue to have the sole possession of first place in the AFC North over Cincinnati that looked, I think, really good against Pittsburgh, despite Pittsburgh putting up some points on them in the first half. So I think this is a game that Baltimore comes out personally and wins. There's always the factor of the Ravens, where sometimes I know the Ravens are going to be favored in a lot of ways, but they can sometimes play down to their opponents. They did in a way against Carolina last week because their offenses could not put points on the board until late in this game. But I think for these quarterbacks that are playing this Baltimore defense for the first time, so Trevor Lawrence does fall into this category, usually they tend to struggle. Now, this is a new defensive system. Don Martindale out, Mike McDonald in. I think, again, if Baltimore can stop Travis Etienne, as I talked about, and I know you've talked about as well, and they can have Trevor Lawrence throw this football, he can do it. He can absolutely do it and put up some numbers. But I think maybe one or two turnovers is the difference in this game. I think it'll be closer than people think it will be. But – I'll say maybe this is like a 27 to 20 Ravens win, like an actually, you know, one possession game where I think Baltimore, they get the job done, but Jacksonville doesn't go away and they put up a fight throughout. It wouldn't surprise me because that's the way Jacksonville is. They, they actually got within, it should have been 20 to 17, but they had a, <laughs> they had an offensive lineman. They went from the four yard line and he, he was ineligible downfield and you got to go five yards to be ineligible. He was in the end zone. So they threw a touchdown and they got called back. So my thing is, dude, you have to go five yards for that to be called. And you were on the four-yard line. So he was trying to block somebody that wasn't even trying to engage him. And the touchdown got called back and they ended up losing 27 to 17 to, to KC. The Jaguars will fight everybody. And everyone who has done these crossovers, I've told them the same thing. <laughs> they ain't, it ain't going to be easy. But – Nine times out of ten, you're going to win, but it's just going to be – Jaguars are that team that people go, I don't feel like dealing with all that because they got some guys who will fight, who will scratch, who will claw. It's like fighting a drunk dude at, you know, when the bar closes. You know you can take him, but he is going to give you the business. And that's what Jaguars do because they have some very, very physical players. You know all those receivers that didn't play for KC Sunday night? You know why they didn't play? Because Andre Sisko sent him to the hospital. That's why they didn't play. See, that's the thing that I'm talking about. This is what will happen when you play him. Trevon Walker's been getting doubled. I hope Baltimore doesn't double him so he can get his sack numbers up because people are thinking, oh, he wasn't worth it. Yes, he was. He's been getting double teamed. The Jacksonville Jaguars are going to play this game very, very tough. If they play their absolute best and Baltimore has one of those ho-hum efforts, it's going to come down to Justin uh, – Justin Justin Tucker kicking it, kicking the ball from St. Augustine and making a 58 yard field goal. And I think uh, the Ravens probably squeak it out 26 24. Yeah, Tucker hits those. Tucker hits those all the time. He does. And I, but I, I ain't going to lie. After Sunday, I was sitting there thinking, is that kid in Cincinnati just as good as him? Because he can hit even. No. I, I don't want to say it because Tucker's the best I've ever seen. That yeah. kid from Cincinnati is kicking from Massillon, dude. Have you you seen what he's done? He's he's made like I don't know how many fifty yarders in a row. He might be Justin Tucker in the future. 
Man, he, it's it's crazy because McPherson has struggled. Or, well, he struggled early this year. He was missing kicks left and right. I think the Pittsburgh game might be the turning point for him. But man, I I have to take Justin Tucker ten. Tucker's times the out best. Of 10. He's the best I've ever seen. Ten, ten times out of ten. So it, it it's crazy because I think with the Ravens and just sometimes their playing down nature, they do usually find ways to win those games. But it's like it's almost like frustrating wins where it's like yeah. this could have been so much easier. But at the same time, for Jacksonville, I think when people think about Jacksonville, sometimes times they think about the teams from a couple of years even like last year with urban meyer and that's not what this team this no. year is you know they have a different identity different coaching staff i think they're much more motivated and, and we see it each and every week with this team and I, i've been impressed with them personally i know this year is probably not the year for them but they're building something that i personally i'm excited for it of their seven losses they lost to kc by 10 the rest of their losses most of them they had the ball driving in a one score game they actually in one of the games they got to the one inch line and time ran out they completed they needed like 17 yards well they know they needed 21 yards they got 20 yards 20 and three quarter yards on a uh like a post route and christian kirk just couldn't drag the guy into the end zone so that's just how it's gone for them they've they've been in a bunch of one score games. they had a one score game at philly in the rain after trevor lawrence threw an interception and fumbled four times he had five turnovers but yet still he still had the ball in his hand down six and they got to midfield and then they obviously screwed it up so there's just a chance man they're gonna fight and they're gonna scrape and they're gonna scratch and and um 26-24, only because they keep losing close games. I'm going to give uh, Justin Tucker uh, a field goal to walk off and win it. Yeah, if there's ever a close game like that, I'm taking Justin Tucker time always. And it's it's funny. So I have 27-20, you have 26-24, but still, I think a good game. I really do think a good game overall. But all right, it's time for Thanksgiving, Tony. We are on Thanksgiving Day here. And we were talking before the show, we were talking about Thanksgiving sides. And we wanted to give our – Number one Thanksgiving, and there are so many to choose from. I know there has been controversy surrounding both current and former Ravens players about their takes on mac and cheese, particularly Marlon Humphrey and Matthew Judon. I think it was a storyline last year where Matthew Judon says something about mac and cheese just not being a, a good Thanksgiving side or something of that nature. It might not be exactly right there, but Marlon Humphrey calls mac and cheese cheese noodles. Yeah. And I, I like mac and cheese. I think mac and cheese is great. There are so many different ways you can do it, and some people just don't do it right. No, they don't, because anybody that calls it cheese noodles, I can tell that they haven't had it done correctly. There's a lot that goes into it. I make it. I'm, I am assigned to make it again this year. And there are 10, 12 ingredients that goes into that cheese sauce. Believe it or not, one of them is Worcestershire sauce. So if you don't think that it's good, uh, a little uh, hit a little cake, cayenne pepper, you have to do it right. And it has to have the right consistency. So it has to have the right consistency. So it's creamy and it's easy on the fork. I feel sorry for people that think it's just cheese and noodles because whoever's been doing them a disservice is th that is dead wrong. But my top side is dressing. Now we don't call it stuffing. We call it dressing and it's made with this perfect texture of mix of cornbread and seafood and gizzards and celery and onions. I had to have me some dressing, man. Dressing is number one for me. My, mine is actually mac and cheese, funny enough. So I, I'm, I'm going to have to send you a mac picture. and cheese sometime. I'm, I'm going to send you a picture of mine. It's going to have a nice you, you, little you have to. I'm going to uh, send it to you. I'm, I'm going to email it to you. I want you to give it to all the Ravens fans. And say, yes, yes. Uh, we I'll, make this mac and cheese. Man, I'm telling you. It, it'll be – I think Thanksgiving is a great holiday. Obviously, spending it with friends, spending it with family, and, and everything like that. And, of course, we have plenty to be thankful here for here over on the Locked On Podcast Network, all the people who tune in and listen, all the hosts, everybody who makes this thing work. I mean, I'm thankful for it most definitely. I am too. And you guys make sure you have a nice holiday with your family uh, on Locked On Jaguars, Locked On Ravens, and everywhere else. And, uh, once again, thankful for everything. David Locke, Ross Jackson, and the entire crew here on Locked On NFL. You guys take care of each other, and we'll see you next time. Huge shout out to Tony and big thanks to him for hopping on and talking Ravens and Jaguars. Again, Jacksonville is a talented team. I still think this is a game Baltimore should win. I want to see a really dominant win, but Jacksonville, they don't go down without a fight. So I still say 27 to 20. That's my final score prediction here for the Ravens and the Jaguars. But that's all I have you here today on this Thanksgiving edition of Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm going to get back here tomorrow. We'll be diving into more Ravens content, diving into our full game preview of the Ravens and Jaguars matchup. Should be sure to stay tuned for that, and I will see you right back here tomorrow.